This is a lecture called, How Do I Read Poetry? This is one of the main things you're supposed to learn in English 111. And um, this is your first introduction to it. We'll talk more about it in the next couple weeks because your first essay is going to be about poetry. But it is my goal to make you feel like you can read any poem in front of you. We're going to actually read hard poems, but that's the best way to practice. I firmly believe that everyone should feel like they can read poetry. After all, it's just words, and as long as you know the words, you can read it. Um, if you don't know the words, you just look them up. So let's get started. Um, how do I read poetry? Okay, here are the basics. And keep in mind, I'll keep track of all the terms that we use, um, and I'll make a list, and you have to learn them. They might come up in quizzes later on, and you'll have to use them in papers and stuff. But don't get confused. Writing about literature and poetry in particular is not about listing literary elements. This is how you get taught in high school. I know that because I used to teach high school. A lot of you had to take the Regents exams and we just get so caught up in learning literary elements that we forget that like writers aren't sitting there just throwing around literary elements. You're just writing and you're doing cool tricks with writing sometimes. And we can describe those cool tri tricks using these terms, but you can write an awesome paper about poetry or literature and never use one of those terms, okay? That's not interesting in and of itself. What's interesting is analyzing the language, all right? That's just my like pet peeve is that professors get so stuck on teaching you literary terms that they forget that you're actually like trying to enjoy reading a poem. These are just ways, these are convenient ways we can describe what we're reading, but um, it's not like the purpose of reading poetry, okay? Anyway, that said, let's launch into some terms. Okay, first of all, what is poetry? Like, how is it different than a newspaper article or a novel? Okay, poetry, when we're, when we're writing poems, and then when we're reading them, we're looking for patterns. That's the main thing. It's patterns. You're writing and you're creating patterns. And these are patterns in sound. These are patterns in rhythm. And these are patterns in form. And there's a lot of patterns that, you know, experienced writers know about and, and use all the time. So a pattern in sound can be a rhyme. So that's a repeated vowel sound inside of a, a word. There's patterns where called alliteration and alliteration is when you start words with the same letter. So that's a pattern, right? Um, and then there's assonance. It's another kind of pattern. It's like rhyme. It's repeated vowel sounds, sometimes like in different parts of the words. Consonance is when you're repeating consonants. So consonants are any letters that are not vowels. Vowels, by the way, are A, E, I, O, U, sometimes Y. Consonants are all the other letters. And then patterns in sound can just be repetition. If you repeat the same word over and over again, well, that's a pattern, okay? So that's something you can note. Now, when we talk about poetry in particular, and this goes for music too, you find patterns in the rhythm. We also call this meter. So sometimes you'll ask, what is the meter of this poem? Mm. And, and that can be like looking for how many syllables there are and counting the metrical feet. This is a very technical poetic term. I don't expect you to memorize it, but I'll introduce it to you um, in the next couple weeks. Again, we're talking about what is poetry. Poetry involves patterns. So there's also patterns in form. This word form will come up a lot. Form is just the shape of something, right? And when you arrange all the words into a certain 
pattern, you can come up with a shape, and we call that form. So poems, as you know, are organized into stanzas. Stanzas, stanza comes from the Italian room, uh, the Italian word for room. So you can think about like different rooms in a poem. It's basically the paragraph, the group of lines in a poem. Couplets are just two lines of poetry. Sometimes they rhyme. A couplet is when you refer to two lines. Quatrain is a group of four lines in poem. And then the rhyme scheme, this is like um, A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D. I'll explain this in more detail, but oops. The rhyme scheme is just the scheme, the pattern of the rhyme. And that's something you look for. Again, remember, poetry is just words organized into patterns. And as a literary scholar, you are looking for those patterns. You can just describe them and sometimes it helps to use the terms. Here's another thing about poetry. Why poetry instead of prose? Okay, prose is a technical term you need to know. Prose is like all writing that's not poetry. So when you're writing an essay, you're writing in prose. Um, a newspaper article is written in prose. Novels, like the novels we're going to read later, those are written in prose. Um, but why does an author sit down and decide to write a poem instead of prose? There's a few reasons. They just like it. But one thing poets like to do is they like to show off their skills. Some of them have mad skills, as one would say. Skills like, are they good at rhyming? Are they good at meter? Do they do tricky things? Some of these um, skills they show off like are so technical that only other poets might even appreciate them or only literary scholars will notice them. Um, you can enjoy a poem without no knowing what all the skills are, but sometimes when you learn all the skills, your appreciation can deepen. By the way, are you taking notes? You should be taking notes. Um, these are all things that might come up on a quiz. All right. By the way, the quizzes are obviously open note because this is, I can't police you from an online class. And also, you know, the point isn't to memorize all this, but it's to learn it and know that this exists and that you can look it up. All right. Why poetry instead of prose? B. Poets are trying to be part of a poetic tradition. So... You know, John Donne wrote sonnets. Shakespeare wrote sonnets. Charlotte Smith, who we're going to read, wrote sonnets. People write sonnets today. You can write a sonnet. And when you write a sonnet, you are being a member of the poetic tradition, um, which is really cool. People like to think of themselves as part of something bigger. So when you're writing, you can say, yay, I'm like Shakespeare. I wrote a sonnet. That's literally what poets are doing when they're writing in the poetic tradition. Finally, why poetry instead of prose? C, the author is using the sound, rhythm, and form of poetry to intensify or disturb the poem's meaning. This is really important. You know, a lot of students are like, are they really doing this on purpose? You know, are you just overanalyzing because you're an English teacher? Yes, I definitely am, but the other thing is that the sound rhythm and form actually do things. They intensify the poem's meaning and sometimes they disturb it or they disrupt the meaning. Like, um, you know, think back on that video by Childish Gambino from the first lecture where there's this like really playful sound, you know, this nice tone, it's very danceable, he's dancing and then suddenly there's like a gunshot and he's like, this is America. Okay, he's disturbing the meaning by combining all of those elements that seem in conflict. In that way, poets do the same thing. We're going to see that happening. Um, by the way, what I just did was in an analysis. I looked at the form and what was going on, and then I analyzed it. That's what we're doing. Okay, so we talked about one, what is poetry? Two, why poetry instead of prose? Now we're on to three. Your job as a scholar of poetry is to A, determine which poetic tricks the poet is using. So when we look at the poems, what you're going to do is you're going to count the syllables. One, two, three, four. I'll teach you how to do that. 
oops, I didn't mean to click. You're going to figure out what the rhyme scheme is, if there is one. We're going to do that. And then finally, you're going to notice patterns and disruptions in the patterns. So you'll notice a nice pattern going along, a simple rhyme scheme, and then boom, the rhyme scheme changes, or boom, the meter suddenly is off. So you're going to remember, we're looking for patterns, and sometimes the patterns break, and that's usually on purpose, okay? Like really tricky writers um, with mad skills are really good at disrupting the patterns, and you notice them when you're paying attention. So basically, your job as a scholar of poetry is to slow down and pay attention. All right. Also, your job as a scholar of poetry is to, here we go with the literary terms, figure out the imagery described. So imagery, we'll talk in more detail. Imagery is when an author creates an image using words. And images can refer to things you see, see smell, taste, touch, hear. So that's what imagery is. And um, sometimes they just describe something like that's the tree in the yard, but then they might use a metaphor, which is a comparison of the tree to something. So the tree is a, um, I'm blanking, the tree is a uh, monument to nature. Or a simile is like a metaphor, but with like the tree is like a monument in nature. Okay, personification is when you give an object human qualities, person qualities. So the tree is um, f has a face that stares at me through the window. Okay, so this is all stuff you've heard probably before, but this is a little bit of a review. Again, remember, you can write perfectly good literary analysis without any of these terms. And I know we're all in the habit of throwing them in in a list from writing regents exams here in New York, or just thinking that's what we do as literary scholars. And I'm telling you now, I'm looking for analysis. These terms can help you with the analysis, but just because you're listing terms does not mean you're writing analysis, okay? Okay, finally, your job as a scholar of poetry is to figure out, aren't you dying to know? Why did this writer use a poem instead of just saying what the boop she wanted us to know? Like, you know, we're gonna read a poem about um, Tom Gray's Elegy, which uh, it's about like sitting in a graveyard contemplating death. Why didn't he just say that? Like, I'm going to sit here and be deep and think about death. Um, why did he write a whole poem instead of just saying that directly? Why? That's a really good question. Like, there are more straightforward ways of communicating things. Well, that's what we're doing. So, again, to review how to read poetry, this is kind of like how to do it. First, you ask yourself, how does the form of the poem help create or disturb its meaning? So you have to... Figure out the form, the patterns, and how does that form create or disturb its meaning? To answer this, you must first figure out what is the form? How did the writer manipulate language? Manipulates a good word, like how did the writer mangle or use the language for his or her own purposes? You look for patterns, look for the patterns and the rhyme in the meter, in the form. And then notice, like, are there weird things going on? And then also you have to ask yourself, figure out what is the meaning of the, per of the poem? What does it mean? How do the patterns and weird things make meaning? This is the most important thing to do when you're writing about literature. You know, not listing the metaphors or, you know, the irony, but figure out the meaning. What's the purpose? What's the point of this? What is the author communicating? And it's not always straightforward, right? Okay, so just practice real fast. We're gonna look at maybe a poem you've read before. We're gonna come back to this later because when we get to the United States, but I just wanted to look at one stanza. We've got a stanza, which as you remember is Italian for room. It's like the a room in a poem, a group of lines, all jumbled together um, and these lines are 
like a paragraph in a poem. We're looking at one stanza from The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe, who, by the way, lived in the Bronx. So let's look at it here. Oops. Bing. Here we go. The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. So what did I say to do? Okay. Figure out the form. Figure out the meaning. Um, just going back through. We're looking for patterns in sound, patterns in rhythm, patterns in form. I'm just going to do this quick, though. We're not going to go into all the depth of this poem because we've got other poems to do for this unit, but let's just look. Okay. The raven. First of all, good to know what a raven is, right? Circle it. That's not a good circle. All right. So just in case you don't know, you can Google Raven. Just look it up. Click on images. That's a raven. Black bird. Symbol of death, by the way. Okay, so we've got bird. This is my new device. Gotta get better at that. Woo, that is not pretty. Okay, so first thing you do, let's read it. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary. Okay, notice I'm reading it like kind of sing-songy. I'm just doing that for an effect. But it does point out that this is a very sing-songy meter. The rhythm is like do 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 right? Once upon a midnight dreary, while I wandered weak and weary. But it's kind of in conflict with like the topic. It's a midnight dreary. Dreary, what does that mean? It means like sad. Oh, that's really bad. I got to get better at that. Um, and gloomy, right? Again, very gothic. Midnight, late at night, while I pondered, weak and weary. Remember, we're looking for patterns. Even if you have no idea what it's saying, like while I pondered, weak and weary. What do we call that? Alliteration. By the way, I'm just demonstrating for you some annotation. So remember, annotating is very important and you have to do this on the poems I'm assigning to you to read. They should literally look like this. All right, once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary, I'm gonna write sing song. It sounds like a song. But bleak. Okay, so there's like an ironic contrast here between the sing songness of it, but the bleakness. Over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. So if you're reading it, you're going to circle the words you don't know. L quaint lore. What are those? You look it up. Okay, so. Once up, what's going on though? Once upon a mid, so it's midnight. He's sitting there thinking, weak and weary. He's not feeling very good. Over many quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. So he's reading old stuff, old weird stuff. He's sitting there at midnight reading old weird weird stuff. Okay, good context. While I nodded, nearly napping. So he's falling asleep. It's getting dreamy. Oh, notice also the nodded, nearly napping. So he's doing all kinds of, remember, we talked about this. Good poets like to do lots of tricks. They're very tricky. So he's doing a lot of alliteration here, right? Okay, I'll just, all alliteration. Suddenly there came a tapping. Okay, so he's falling asleep. He's reading old weird stuff. And then he, suddenly there came a tapping as of someone gently rapping. Rapping is like an old fashioned word for knocking. Um, he's not like hearing someone do hip hop at his chamber door. As of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Remember, look for patterns. Rapping, rapping. What do we call that? 
Repetition, repetition. God, that's really bad, Milson. Okay, you got it. At my chamber door. Oh, look, more, look at this. More repetition. Chamber door is in two lines there. T Tis some visitor, I muttered. He's talking to himself here. Just noted. He's talking to himself. I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this and nothing more. Well, do we really think there's nothing more? I don't know. Look at the, whoa. What is this? Effects? Cool. Okay, we're going to use that. All right. Now, let's look at, so we've, got, we've gotten through it. We've figured out what's going on. You want to figure out what's going on. He's sitting there in his library reading weird old stuff. He's falling asleep. It's midnight. He's not feeling too good. And then suddenly there came a tapping as if, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door to some visitor. So he's talking to himself and there's someone interrupting him. Aren't you curious now? All right, but let's go look, let's look at the form again. We've got how many lines in this stanza? Actually, I'm going to do this because I can easily type. Um... All right, so form, we've got stanza, six lines, and then let's look at the rhyme here. Weary lore, tapping door, door more. Okay, so the way you, you do this is each line gets a letter. So the first line is A, A, oh, weird rainbow. Okay, weary, does anything else rhyme with that? No, so nothing else will get an A. Lore is the next line and it's not rhyming with weary. So it's a new letter, B, weary, lore. Does anything else rhyme with lore? Lore tapping door, door, more, yes. So we've got B, all the lines that rhyme, B, B. Okay, and then tapping gets a C. Now you see there's some internal rhyming going on, tapping and napping, but, um, and rapping. Look at that, rapping, rapping. That's all internal rhyme, but that doesn't go into the rhyme scheme. The scheme here, Um, the scheme is the end of the lines, okay? So then what you say is uh, rhyme scheme A, B, C, B, B, B. And if you look at the rest of the poem, it, it's the same each stanza, all right? Just looking at, the, looking at some patterns. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary. So then you look, let's count the syllables. Syllables are each beat, or each um, collection of sounds. So once is one syllable, upon, upon, you can clap. So that's two, three, a midnight dreary. So once upon, uh, I'm counting with my fingers, you can't see it. Once upon a midnight dreary, that's eight syllables while I pondered weak and weird. Oops, I, hold on, I messed it. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary. That's 16 syllables. All right, this is tedious. Sixteen. Over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. Oh, that's 16 again. Curious could be three, but I counted it as two. You could choose. While I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping. Ooh, 16 again. Cool. He does this on purpose, by the way. Like, this just doesn't happen, you know, magically. As of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. As of someone gently rapping at my chamber door. Okay, 15. It's close. I double checked. It would have been cooler if it was all 16. 
Tis some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Fifteen again. Only this and nothing more. Seven. So I just counted all the syllables. Only this and nothing more. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, and then what I would do if I were reading the whole poem, I'd check the next stanza. Is it following these same patterns? All right. Anyway, um, I'm going to cut this off now. It's been 25 minutes. I'm going over, but I wanted you to see how this worked. Um, so we've got some guy at midnight feeling sick, tired, reading some old weird books, falling asleep, and here's a knocking. Someone knocking. And he talk then talks to himself. He's like, oh, it's nothing. No, it's a visitor. Okay. All right. I hope this helps. Oh, one last thing. I want you to make sure you go on to, under resources on the page. There, I have uploaded our um, prosody handbook. This is something that goes into great detail, and I'll talk about it more, but it goes into detail about how to use technical terms to describe language. That's what prosody is, it's the study of the patterns of language. So you're gonna wanna look at this and start reading it and annotating it. And by the way, when on the assignments I ask you to annotate these poems and upload pictures of them to the discussion boards um, in, in, the next, in the unit on poetry, this here, see this? This is what I'm looking for. Um, now let's go over the terms. How do I read poetry? Okay, what, what terms do we go uh, cover? Well, let's go back to the lecture. Let's go to the beginning. I'll give you a link to this. Okay, so we've got rhyme, assonance, alliteration, consonants, and for assonance you need to know what vowels are. You probably already do. Consonants, you need to know what consonants are. Okay, repetition, you probably know what that is. Um, you have to know what meter is. You have to know what syllables are. You have to know uh, what stanzas, couplets, quatrains are. Okay, we've got rhyme scheme. We've got, do we put stanza? Yep. Prose, you need to know what poetry is. Form, We've got imagery. Wow, we learned a lot. This is probably all review, but that's okay. Metaphor, simile, personification. And then from the poem, we had um, dreary, quaint, lore, and rapping. Dreary, quaint, lore, rapping not just hip hop, lol. Okay, all right, again, you don't have to memorize all this, but you need to know what all these words mean. You need to have somewhere you can go to look them up in case they come up in a quiz. Good luck, and don't forget to email me if you have any questions.